Um, so Jim Tierney is here. He is the uh, Assistant Commissioner for Water at New York State DEC. He, uh, I learned today by reading his bio, he is admitted to the bar with the U.S. Supreme Court and received the, um, the Public Official of the Year Award from NRDC in 2007. He um, was the Inspector General, the Watershed Inspector General for the New York City Watershed and that's when I first met him, and he, that's an office housed in the New York uh, Attorney General's office to oversee all the programs for the New York City Watershed Agreement. And uh, he's been at DEC now since then. And I will say there is a Water Management Advisory Committee. When I first met Jim, he made a point of having meetings for the environmental community to come in and talk so he could listen. And the quarterly meeting of the Water Management Advisory Committee is an ongoing opportunity to do that at DEC that I think is very important. Thanks coming for coming, Jim. First thing I'd like to say is thanks to Simon and Maureen and all the people who were announced earlier for taking action and being involved in a watershed alliance. Uh, I, I'm a Hudson Valley kid myself, and I grew up in Dutchess County, Southern Dutchess County, in the town of Wappingers. And my creek was the Fishkill Creek. I don't know if there's a watershed alliance for it, but please form one if there isn't. And, and, and I was all up and down that creek. I had six boys in one bedroom. I had to escape from that house. I escaped to the creek. I loved it. I still go down there when I get home uh, to see my family today, so, so thanks. Um, now, I had a title, like, I, I really just want to talk about what Al was talking about. <laughs> because Al and I would have a very good long conversation. He was on one side of the New York City watershed program, and I kind of picked it up on the other side. And um, in between was uh, you know, the early part of the Pataki administration and the Giuliani administration, where a lot of the fur was flying. And I mean, it was something else for a while there on the New York City program. And what I can just say that before I get into the, the ba basic of my talk, talk is things are going pretty darn well. I've delivered um, and involved in negotiations with Al's, you know, uh, people followed Al at the New York City DEP commissioners, uh, three individual filtration avoidance determinations along with leadership at EPA, State Department of Health, uh, Catskill Watershed Corporation, and, um, the, you know, the whole farm, farm programs and, and the like. And um, we'll have a 20th anniversary in 2017 where we'll be delivering yet another filtration avoidance determination. And as Al said, the amount of money that's been saved and then reinvested in the watershed is really quite remarkable. It's probably not enough, but it is working. And so um, I, I can commend Al and commend people who've worked on this program in the room and elsewhere because it is a, a world-class model. And what we learn in the New York City watershed, and I'll mention Fran Dunwell a little bit later, my head of the Hudson River Estuary Program at DEC, what we've learned through that collaboration on the Hudson River, um, is something I think is exportable, that is very useful elsewhere uh, around the country, around the state, and, and around the world, and, and it is, uh, you know, it's good to see happening. So Maureen Cunningham, thank you. Simon Gruber, thank you. Um, the title that I they said I wanted to talk about today was water quality, water resiliency, and water habitat. Um, and what we're finding uh, in the aftermath of Sandy, Lee, and Irene, which has sort of taken over my life. Before when I came into this job, it was the Clean Water Act in New York. It was a few sort of watershed programs that were limping along, but the Hudson River Estuary Program was actually flying along. Um, uh, dam safety, uh, floodplain management, um, and then oversight, in particular, of the New York City Watershed Program. But um, starting in 2011, I think 60% of my time is resiliency. Uh, Lee, Irene, 
Sandy, of course, localized flood impacts in the Mohawk Valley, these freak storms that are showing up right now, and really blowing apart streams and hitting communities. Um, and, and, and it is really something to see sort of the ship turning in New York. Um, some people said, well, you have to be hit hard twice. There'll be a second Sandy, have to be a second Sandy before you really pay attention. Um, but I'm not sure about that. People seem to be t paying attention. And my sense is that the resiliency realm is gaining, gaining steam. And it's gaining, gaining, gaining steam for a number of reasons. I want to walk you through you know, you know, how that works and begin with just a few things. One, of course, is climate change and climate disruptions. It's probably going to be most significant, most significant felt impact in the realm of water resources. Um, I don't have to tell the intelligent people in this room about the concept of the drought and deluge effect. That in some areas we're going to get freak storms that will blow communities apart. Look what happened in, you know, in South Carolina, for example, recently. Um, after I, Lee and Irene, um, you know, we saw 16 inches of rainfall fall in the New York City watershed. Um, uh, you know, and that 16-inch rainfall was something the National Weather Service staff told me they were sort of freaked out about saying we're going to have 16 inches of rain because they thought they'd be criticized as some, that's just ludicrous, that's insane. How can you say 16 inches of rain is going to fall from the sky in the Catskills. Well, that rainfall has been topped elsewhere in New York State since then. And we're seeing it in other parts of the country. Remember that freak storm that happened in Colorado, where a supercell parked over Colorado and did things that nobody really thought was, was possible. And so we're seeing that elsewhere. And then we're also seeing droughts on the other end. You know, California's a, a, a big example. But the one that I would commend you to, and there was an interesting part in a book called The Big Thirst by Charles Fishman, uh, where a river, a Hudson River type river in Australia went dry. I mean, it literally went dry. The only water that came into that river was slosh and tidal feed from the ocean. And that happened over a six year, per a seven year period. And that book details the type of things that a society runs into, an advanced society runs into, when the water goes away. And, you know, people talking about Syria as an example of possibly a climate change or drought-driven civil war. Very interesting. And then we get into the ideas of the resilience dividend. I think um, there's a book by Judith Roden that I just finished reading who's chair of the Rockefeller Foundation. And the Rockefeller Foundation is doing wonderful, wonderful work in the realm of resiliency internationally. And they use a very interesting term, I thought. She uses the dividend, the things you get back when you do resiliency or sustainability. If you want to call it economic, you know, ecosystem services or an economic return, there is a great dividend that comes if you do resiliency as a, as a society. And um, I think we're going to have to do that, of course, is, as you all know, the 100-year storm and the 500-year storm is getting increasingly frequent. But recall that the 500-year storm isn't a storm of biblical proportions. It's not. People think it'll happen, you know, twice between, you know, you know once or twice between the time of now and, and, and Columbus. But the chance of a 500-year storm, which we really don't seek to protect against very often, is a 6% chance within a 30-year time frame that you'll be, your house, your home, your neighborhood, will be in a place that's hit with a 500-year storm. 6% chance in 30 years is a worse chance, worse odds, than your house catching fire. It's less likely your house will catch fire then it'll experience a 500-year storm. And then we have just the basic rules of thumb that kind of you can use as you're talking with people. The power of water. One cubic foot of water. 62 pounds. Actually, 62.4 pounds, because I see Phil there, because he'll correct me. Um, you get a wall of water moving down a valley. It moves things. It really moves things.
and I've seen it, and you've all seen it. So the impact of our built environment in making these walls of water move and rip up our countryside and rip up our streams really stem and can be enhanced by how we manipulate or poorly manage our landscapes. Think of wetland fills, of course. Streams cut off from their floodplains, impervious surfaces. Now, I talk about impervious surfaces. I'm glad Al mentioned the term, uh, so I don't seem too nerdish. But one acre of asphalt will generate 13, 14 times. It's basically basic engineering rule of thumb. The amount of water as one acre of meadow, one acre of forest. So when you have an impervious surface that hasn't been managed some effective way across the horizon, and we see a lot of that in the Hudson Valley, you're sending out huge amounts of water into a stream that was built over time, over the eons, to handle X amount of water. But all of a sudden, two, three, four, even five times the amount that that stream was built to handle is going down there. You add in floodplain berms, walls, constrictions, and the like, and the streams literally get ripped apart. And that ripping apart of a stream causes sedimentation, adds phosphorus, damages the ecology, silts in trout spawning beds, and has a whole host of adverse impacts. So I want to talk just a little bit about a major way to address this. You know, of course, beyond what we have to get on, which is getting to a, you know, a non-carbon based energy system, um, is to adapt to more extreme weather. And when you adapt to more extreme weather, Effectively, and I think the thinking out there is very advanced now, and it makes sense. It just falls into place. It makes a very persuasive case, generally, that you have all sorts of co-benefits that come along with it when you address resiliency and water resiliency effectively. You all probably learned in the fifth, maybe sixth grade, the hydrologic cycle and how that works. Well, restoring the hydrologic cycle is fundamental element of resiliency. So if you rebuild with resiliency over time, and I'll talk about exactly what that means, you have to do it over time, but you have to do it every time. You have to do it over time, but you have to do it every time. If you're replacing a bridge, you don't replace a bridge in kind. If a culvert needs to be repaired, you don't replace a culvert in kind. And Fran Dunwell and her team is doing a lot of work there. I think Scott Cuppet is here as well. You have to figure out a way to make sure that resiliency is built into basically everything you rebuild as well as everything you build. So you're familiar with resiliency from the standpoint of, okay, it has to be firm enough to withstand wind or rain. But in the realm of water, it really falls into the larger theory of green infrastructure, which is something that's also catching fire around the state and around the country. And green infrastructure to me just means it's, it's summarized really well in the catchphrase of slow water down, spread water out, soak water in. Slow it down, spread it out, soak it in. And then frequently just get the hell out of the way if you're in a flood zone. Now, numerous innovative techniques have been developed. They're really exciting. Landscape architects, innovative engineers. My niece is going into this field. She's at Harvard and MIT. I can brag about her a little bit, but she's doing her graduate work in this right now. And the really bright young people in the country are intensely focused on this in the architectural field. It's not like build the coolest building. It's like build, a, build an area that works. And a big part of that is does the ecology of it work? Does the water environment in it work? So. We can take this ingenious work and we can deploy it in a number of ways if we think in terms of co-benefits. Co-benefits. You'll hear that term a lot. Basically, you know, I don't like to use this, but killing two birds with one stone, killing five birds with one stone. And then thinking of partnerships. Because one thing that Judith Roden shows very well in her book, The Resilience Dividend, is that resilience can't work if it's not done through a partnership. Nobody can do it alone. Nobody is large and in charge on resiliency. Nobody's large and in charge when it comes to making this society better.
because the same techniques that capture water on the environment reduce peak floods. It also recharges the groundwater. That helps stem drought. It also slows water and cleanses it as it works its way through the soil and sends the water as base flow into streams, providing more water, providing habitat for fish. It also, um, if you listen to you know, the science and, and look at some of the items on the EPA website, if green infrastructure is employed in urban landscape, it can help, of course, mitigate combined sewer overflows and stormwater pollution runoff if you hold it through all these great engineering and architectural techniques. But apparently, you know, it clearly beautifies the neighborhood. And it also leads to some level of social calming. If you live in a neighborhood that's green and pretty and valued, it cools people off. So it calms them down. If you add riparian buffers to it, riparian buffers apparently, according to my staff, are one of the most cost-effective ways of reducing pollution, phosphorus pollution, nitrogen pollution, sediment pollution. It also stabilizes streams. So let me give you some examples of how this would work and where we have to replace things. There's an Ilian, Ilian, a bridge in the village of Ilian in upstate New York. It's small. We did a study of that watershed. That stream, that bridge, causes water to back up six feet in the 100-year storm, six feet high, heads to the left, and goes right down Main Street. Is that a bridge or a culvert or a piece of infrastructure that's successful? If just there, we're able to span the watershed, and I mean the larger watershed, the flood watershed, we'll protect that town and save a lot of money and it'll really be worth it. So, and then you have to actually get involved in, in some extenses, maintaining the protective infrastructure. You know, an example of that would be the Gilboa Dam up on Schoharie Creek and in, in, uh, in Schoharie Reservoir. Uh, I was in the office when that dam was hit during Hurricane Irene. And we had video of it, and we had telemetry on it, and all of a sudden it went out simultaneously. I called frantically to the, um, down to my dam safety people and said, what does it mean? It means, could mean that the dam has just moved, Jim. And there are 55,000 people in the emergency flood zone if that dam had fallen down. It hadn't fallen down, but the alarms went up, off, up and down the valley. And, um, and people just ran for the hills. And actually, some people may have survived because they ran from the, up the hills during Irene. So handling the gray infrastructure when it comes to water resiliency and handling it in the least offensive way is going to be important. That dam had gotten out of compliance. It had gotten in great state of disrepair. And now to New York City DEP's great credit, they've fixed it, and they fixed it really well. And I also think we have to think in terms of not only compensating for the way human ecology throws the hydraulic cycle off kilter, but think in terms of silver buckshots, not silver bullets. Diffuse practices across the landscape. Building criteria where the bridge has to pass the 100-year storm, in some instances the 500-year storms, that you can't build in the floodplains and you have to locate out of it that we remove stream constrictions actively, including some of the dams that are causing problems around. That we protect every wetland we can and we restore them wherever possible. Even in just an engineering standpoint, the big old tanks protecting us all over the environment. If you don't give one wit about the ecology, the wonderful ecology of wetlands. And then you have a double whammy that particularly affects the Hudson River watershed. It's an estuary, a tidal estuary. So you have both sea level rise and you have very severe riverine flooding that can affect a community. And so if you want to learn how to do that effectively, I'm sure some of you have, I really want to commend to your attention uh, a project of the Hudson River Estuary Program in the city of Kingston, the village of Catskill, and the village of Pier Piermont, where they got people together from scenic Hudson, 
um, from the MIT Consensus Building Institute, and all these local leaders, and they built something that looks like it will have legs. And it'll have legs because it was built from the ground up over a period of time and a lot of haranguing among the community. But it's what we're going to have to do if we want to build resiliency community by community. It's going to be critical to do that. The local ownership, as Al said, of your watershed and the local ownership of your resiliency going forward. I really like programs and things that have legs. Now, not to depress you all, but I'm just going to go through very rapidly the type of things that are going on right now around the state and I encourage you to participate in. Of course, get involved in the Hudson River Estuary Program. Fran is phenomenal, her team is great, they're exciting, and the closest thing to full-blown activists within government I know of. They are fantastic. <laughs> Other things we've been doing are things like the New York Works Program, where 203 stream projects, stream resiliency projects that mitigate flood, have been implemented over the last two years. We have 120 communities in the New York Rising program that get money for planning and money for projects to get it going. Not as good as Fran's program, I'll say, but pretty good. We have Army Corps projects going on along the coast, some that are doing fairly innovative things, not what you really think of in an Army Corps project, but that's $2.5 billion worth of work. Sandy brought bringing about $30 billion to New York State. Hazard Mitigation Grant Program money from FEMA. We're using that to do things like build a berm in Jamaica Bay on this old piece of degraded property. But it's a berm made up of wetlands and maritime forests and dunes and habitat and shellfish reefs to protect the, um, the, the, the western flank of Howard Beach. In Suffolk County, we're using resiliency money to build sewer systems to stem nitrogen pollution that goes in the Great South Bay. $388 million worth. In Nassau County and Bay Park, we're build, rebuilding a wastewater treatment plant that got flooded from Sandy, the Bay Park plant. But we're rebuilding it with a 500-year level of resiliency. And we're going to build an ocean outfall with nitrogen treatment as well to save the marshlands that provide a way of water resiliency for the southern flank of Nassau County. We're spending $340 million for wastewater treatment plants, but not wastewater treatment plants you know, for, for, for treatment, to make them resilient to future floods. And we're going around the state doing post-flood emergency stream training to try and get communities not to do recreational bulldozing in your streams after the latest floods. Show them how to respond and respond properly. And of course, throughout the state, we're encouraging green infrastructure on every front and trading CSO money, combined sewer overflow money, in order to make green infrastructure happen on the urban landscape and much more. So I want to commend you for this meeting. I want to commend you for getting this organization going and working so well. Um, Pester Fran for more money to help the Watershed Alliance. I, you know, I can tell you I'm a very big supporter of that, Simon and Murray. And, and if you can prevail upon Fran for more money to assist and grow, that's a good thing. And, um, and I'll be around as, as for a little bit if anybody wants to talk. But if something comes up and it is, you know, that you particularly want to talk with me about as it goes forward, um, as things go forward and your efforts go forward, give me a call. And if you have a, your pen handy, you can take this number down. I'd love to hear from the people who know what's going on on the ground. Uh, my number, again, it's Jim Tierney, and I'm at 518-402-2794. I'd love to hear from you for sometimes. Thank you.